the October 6th Finance Committee meeting. Uh, as chair of the, the committee, I call this meeting to order. Our next item on the agenda is reports and announcements. Uh, Mr. Mizikar. Um, no particular reports or announcements here um, this evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Uh, we shall now proceed to accepting the minutes of uh, September 15th, 2022. Uh, does any member of the board have any comment on the on the meeting minutes that were posted on the Google Drive? I move that we accept the September fifteenth um, Finance Committee meeting minutes. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion passes. We shall now move to the town manager's report, Mr. Mizikar. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alex is going to run through the town manager's report. Dave, if you can just go ahead and slide. All right, thank you. So in front of you, you'll see you have a copy of Schedule A local receipts. This is something that we'll try to provide to you each month at your meetings, just an update of this particular revenue category. So you'll see that for FY23 year to date, we've collected $1,502,493 which is approximately 12.6 of the budgeted revenue in this category. Um, you'll see one of the biggest categories is motor vehicle excise, and through the first quarter we've collected um, a little bit, about $10,000 more than we collected through the first quarter last year. Next thing we'll talk about is certified free cash. Um, this is the unappropriated fund balance that we have at the end of each fiscal year, kind of our a safety net or um, rainy day fund. So our certified free cash as of July 1st, 2022 is 9,198,615. Going down to retained earnings. These are um, the enterprise fund at unrestricted net assets. So you'll see pay as you throw has a retained earnings of 528,230. The water enterprise has retained earnings of 2439131 and the stormwater enterprise has retained earnings of $3,117,207. Any questions from the board? Thank you, Alex. Does that conclude uh, the town manager's report? Anything else? No. Uh, very well, we shall then uh, proceed to our public hearing. Uh, do I have a motion to open the public hearing for the October 17th, 2022 Special Town Meeting Warrant? So moved. A second? Second. All, opposed, uh, all who approve say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The motion passes. We shall now move to the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, if, if uh, you don't mind, I could just kind of run through the upcoming dates associated with the uh, special town meeting before we get into the Warren Articles. That sounds uh, fair. Thank you. Uh, so this evening, uh, the, f the Finance Committee will uh, consider uh, recommendations for all 13 Warren Articles that have been uh, approved for the warrant by the Board of Selectmen. Um, and then um, with that information in hand, staff will move uh, tomorrow morning to finalize the uh, packets for all town meeting members and we'll mail those out. Uh, we'll provide email notice to those who we have emails for. Um, the Board of Selectmen will deliberate and consider recommendations for Warren articles at their meeting coming up this Tuesday, October 11th. And then finally, uh, this is all in preparation for the October 17th, 20. 22 town meeting it will be held at 7 p.m. at the Oak Middle School, which is the traditional location. So we do have 13 Warren articles for the Finance Committee's uh, consideration during this public hearing this evening. And um, we have various staff members who will uh, assist in providing the Finance Committee the details that you need to uh, make a recommendation. So we're happy to begin at any time, Mr. Chairman, uh, and work through, work through the warrant. Yes, please proceed, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. So Article 1 is an article to amend the general bylaws. Article 14, which is the dog control bylaw. Um, there's two things um, 
associated with this um, change, excuse me, one thing associated with this change uh, would be um, to reduce the holding period uh, required to hold uh, dogs that are seized and un unlicensed and unable to find or uh, otherwise unable to find the owner from 10 to 7 days. Uh, this will align us with the state statutes associated with this and re reduce any, any unnecessary kenneling fees. Um, the town has a partnership with the Worcester Animal Rescue League. Whenever um, any entity of the town um, takes a dog that's stray and we're unable to find the owner because it's not tagged, um, we take it to the Worcester Animal Rescue League and they hold that for a fee on a daily basis for us. Currently that's for up to 10 days. Uh, we'd like to reduce that to seven. At the end of the seven day holding period, the Worcester Animal Rescue League um, has a full physical performed on the animal and then prepares the dog for adoption. So uh, I had a question on that, Mr. Mizikar. Um, do we have any like studies that show uh, how many days a person who's lost their dog actually comes to, 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 to the town to reclaim it? So would this basically, my question is basically, would this affect people's ability to get their lost dogs back in any sort of way? Um, I don't have any data in front of me, um, to be honest with you, but normally um, someone that's actually seeking to get their dog back will immediately come to the town hall or the police department if, you know, if it's on a weekend. And if the dog has made it over to Worcester Animal Rescue League, it's easy for them to recover. They just go straight there. They're open seven days a week. Um, so I don't see this as a barrier to someone being able to retrieve the dog if they actually want to do that. Um, we oftentimes through the police department webpage and um, excuse me, Facebook page share this whenever we have a dog that we don't know whose it is. So we do our best to notify everyone as well. Any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Oh, I'm sorry, Diana. No, I just I wanted to, to make a comment. Um, I really do appreciate the, the tie to the, the strategic plan in all of the slides, so I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Yep. I can, I can just talk about that for one second, sure. uh, if you don't mind. Thank you. So um, while we have a draft strategic plan and we're going through the final phase of public comment, we are both conditioning ourselves and trying to work transparently with the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, Town Meeting, and the rest of the community to show how we're implementing the strategic plan and how every decision that we make is based upon the public feedback that we've received. Um, so uh, we are tying each and every Warren article to the strategic plan to illustrate how it connects back to that. Any more questions, uh, Carlos? Um, I know that this article is specifically referring to dogs, but what, up, what about other animals? Um, so any other domestic animals like cats would fall into the same category? Same, okay. Yep. Great. Yes, ma'am, please. Uh, please come up to the mic, uh, identify yourself, give your address and your precinct number. Uh, Sandy McManus, Precinct 10. Do you want my address? Your address is well, Crafton yes. Street. Thank you. I just had a question about the animals. The reason why the 10 days has it got anything to do with to see whether the dog has rabies? I don't know how they, they came up with that 10 days, so I'm in my mind. Mm -hmm. That was the only, that's the only question I had. Mr. Musica. I'm not aware of any direct tie. Um, you know, if an animal is rabid, it's normally immediately detectable by, you know, anim those who are familiar with, you know, animals and dogs. Um, so I, I don't believe it has any tie to that. The animal control officer will be available at a town meeting to answer a more detailed question like that, though, but it's not my understanding that it's tied to that. The, the, the Massachusetts general laws were reduced from 10 days to seven days uh, about 10 years ago. So I would think if there was a medical purpose like that, that it wouldn't have been changed at the state level, but we are just moving in the direction that the general laws did a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mizikar. Any other questions or comments from the public? If not, we can move to Article 2. Article two of the general bylaws is to amend section E of article 10, which is associated with uh, penalties and violations uh, for handicap parking. This would increase the, the current fine of $100 uh, and raise it up to $300. Uh, is there 
Uh, I have Justin Dobson here who is uh, staff to the Commission on Disabilities to provide further details about this initiative. Good evening, Finance Committee members. My name is Justin Dobson, and as Mr. Miscar indicated, I've been providing staff support to the Commission on Disabilities over the last several months, and we've been discussing this initiative at the last few meetings that we've had. Um, so presently, Article 10 of our general bylaws is known as the Handicap Parking Bylaw. It charges a $100 fine for violations of handicap parking. Um, I just want to give a, a brief background on the legislative history and kind of the history of, behind this article. The article was first implemented in 1984. Uh, at last week's select board meeting, I had indicated it was last amended in 1984, but it was adopted in 1984, and the fine amount at that time was $15. In 1991, town meeting members elected to increase it from $15 to $100. And that's the last time we've ever amended the, the fine amount. I, I would like to point out, uh, if you review the town meeting minutes from that 1991 meeting, the original Warren article was to actually increase it from 15 to 25, but town meeting members did a, an amendment on the floor and elected to increase it to the statutory maximum at that point, which is $100. So we're requesting town meeting members take a, a similar sort of action today and increase it from the statutory minimum of 100 to the statutory maximum of $300. Um, I'd like to just provide some information on what we would like to do with the additional revenue and uh, the amount of revenue that the town currently gets. Uh, so from fiscal year 2008 to fiscal year 2020, the Shrewsbury Police Department on average issued 33 parking tickets related to handicapped parking violations every year. Uh, so that would translate to $3,300 in revenue that goes to local receipts currently. What we're recommending is that the initial $100 would still go to local receipts so that there would be no fiscal impact on the town and the, the revenue that the town is collecting to local receipts, and that the additional $200 would be allocated to the Commission on Disabilities, which would be deposited into what we've been referring to as a 22G parking fund. Uh, that refers to a provision in the Mass General Law, MGL Chapter 40, Section 22G, which if the select board were to adopt it, could allow money from those fines to be allocated to the commission. So that revenue, what we would like to do is utilize it to fund accessibility initiatives. So other towns have done things like purchase beach accessible wheelchairs for communities on the Cape or on the South Shore. Uh, other communities have uh, purchased um, magnifying devices for use in the library for patrons who uh, may have low vision. Um, other municipalities have initiated a grant application program where members of the community or town departments could apply for funding uh, that relates to accessibility initiatives. Um, the, the key thing that I want to point out with respect to this fund is the, the money does carry over year to year. Uh, so if we were to increase the fine, we'd anticipate it goes from 3300 a year to 9900 6600 going into this account. Um, that money could fund an accessibility initiative outright, or you could carry it over year to year to, to make a bigger purchase, or you could use it as seed money for a grant application. So the, the town recently applied for an ADA planning grant, and we were informed by the consultant who was helping us with that grant application that if you commit matching funds, even a few thousand dollars, that that really strengthens your grant application. So we committed a few thousand in funds and were able to leverage that and get almost $97,000 back from the state. Um, so we could do something similar in, in that respect because now we're able to apply for, for capital improvement uh, grants through the Mass Office on Disability. So um, there's no shortage of accessibility initiatives that we could use this revenue for and happy to answer any questions that uh, Finance Committee members may have. So this is just a comment, Mr. Dobson. Uh, first of all, thank you. This, this you, you explained it very well, and, and uh, the, the very fact that we're going to be using it for disabilities is very apt. Um, but do we expect, I mean, it's hard to say uh, in terms of planning, if we're getting 33 fines every year, given the fact that we're increasing the, the penalty, there may be a drop in the amount of uh, violations that we do observe. Yeah, so that was 
one thing that I mentioned in the select board meeting last week, I think in an ideal world, we get zero dollars in revenue, to be quite honest, because that means people are following the law and ensuring that people with disabilities here in town can access uh, all that the town has to offer. Um, so you're correct, the revenue could fluctuate year to year. Any comment, uh, Mr. Miller, please. So on, on the flip side, you know, uh, have we identified any repeat offenders and you know, do we have a plan to you know, some staggered fees of fine uh, beyond 300? So the, the statutory maximum would be 300. The, the only provision I've seen is where towns will assess additional fines of let's say $50 if you don't pay within the 21 day time frame. Uh, but beyond that, the 300 would be the, the cap that we'd be able to levy. Um, I think personally, the people who would be parking in these spots wouldn't care if it was 100 or 300. I think uh, if you do park in a, an accessible parking space, you're, you're showing just disregard for others. And I don't uh, know that the, the fine amount really factors into their mind when they're doing that. But I think if they do get a $300 fine, that's certainly going to be eye-opening compared to the 100, and they might not do something like that in the future. So, thank you. Um, was there any consideration of moving the fine um, in total to that disability fund, or, or we're required to keep some part of it into into the local receipts? Uh, there was some consideration. I think the the recommendation of keeping that 100 going to the local receipts would uh, strengthen the concept, to be, to be quite frank, if we're going to town meeting and saying that this proposal will have no fiscal impact versus it, it may have a fiscal impact. I think that was the, the logic behind that, that split there. Any other questions from the board? Jim. Um, Justin, you had mentioned examples, the magnifier, the beach mm -hmm. uh, chair, with an increase going from 100 to 300 um, would you anticipate some sort of wish list we would have in town to so address like what may come our way in terms of funding? We, so that that planning grant I had spoken about, um, we had completed an ADA self evaluation and transition plan recently. Um, so that gave us a whole list of accessibility issues with respect to municipal owned buildings and properties. So some of the lower hanging fruit there, where it might cost you know a few thousand, that could be things that these dollars could be used to, to address. Um, a lot of those issues that need to be remedied are required by the Americans with Disabilities Act, but some of the things that are recommended in that plan are what they call uh, universal design or best practice. So it's not something that's legally required, but it's something that would enhance the lives of people with disabilities here in town. Um, so I think items like that that we could focus on that may not be uh, as expensive as doing a capital improvement project that would cost a lot more money, we could tackle some of those smaller items that we might not necessarily be required to do, but again, would right. improve access and the quality of life for people with disabilities here. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos. I just have a procedural question. Um, once town meeting, if they approve this, does the new fine um, maximum go into effect right away, or is there does so it would require the, the additional action of the select board to adopt that uh, provision of the, the Mass General Law. So usually when the town is adopting a, a new MGL, we have to go to town meeting and request that they adopt it. But the way the statute is worded, it says that if you have a duly established commission on disability, you can, you can establish that fund. It just requires that, that select board action. Um, so we're, we're requesting town meeting members to increase the fine first, and then we would do that next uh, component of establishing the funds subsequently. Thank you. If I could that would be at a subsequent uh, town meeting? Oh. Uh, board of Selectmen meeting. Works. Yeah. And just one other thing. So all of our general bylaws, when adopted by town meeting, need attorney general's review. Correct. So it may take up to 120 days for them to do that. And then upon their confirmation and review, then it would go into effect. Any other questions from the board? I open it to the public. Any member of the public has any questions or comments on this particular article? If not, uh, thank you, Justin. Uh, we shall move to Article 3. Thank you. Have a good night. So Article 3 is to um, 
amend the general bylaw article 28 which is the town of shrewsbury tree bylaw which was established at the may 2022 uh, annual town meeting uh, and as I just mentioned, um, the Attorney General reviews all our local bylaw actions um, and notice that our general bylaw as proposed was inconsistent with the uh, Massachusetts general laws in that we had set a $500 maximum fine, but the statutory limit for fines of this type under the general laws is only $300. So they rejected that section of our bylaw. So we are simply um, seeking to reinstate that section and adjust it from $500 to $300 for any violations of this bylaw. So um, no other changes, but um, just wanted to point that out or wanted to explain why we needed to come back to town meeting. Any questions or comments from the board? So, so I have a question. Go ahead, Carter. <laughs> Um, I was just curious where we are in our tree city application. Just okay. submitted it this past week. Awesome. Cool. Okay. So, Kevin, uh, where does this money go? Does it also go to local receipts, or um... yeah, it would just it would just be a local receipt that comes in under fines and penalties. Yep. Any questions or comments from the public? If not, Kevin, we can move on to Article Four. So Article 4 um, makes several adjustments to the budget that was adopted uh, at the May 2022 town meeting for fiscal year 23, which runs from July 1st of 2022 through June 30th of 2023. Um, there are um, several items that I will detail. I do want to note out preliminarily before we go through this article and other funding articles that since the adoption of the operating budget at the annual town meeting, um, the state adopted their budget uh, in July, and then we were able to have the assessor continue to work to assess the uh, value of property through June 30th in town uh, when it comes to new growth. Um, so both the estimate that we used for state aid and the estimate that we used for new growth um, has changed from um, May, just with the additional time and information that we have. And that has provided a little over $866,000 in additional revenue that will be received uh, from those sources. So we'll utilize uh, those funds through several Warren articles this evening, and I'll detail those out. The first place that we're gonna use uh, some of those funds is within uh, the first change that's proposed through this article which is covering $106,937.50 in uh, debt service associated with the final borrowing for uh, the construction of the police station. We are not using the exempted levy uh, to cover this um, initiative, so therefore we will be not raising to the entire levy limit. Uh, rather, we will uh, stay that $107,000 roughly short of the total levy that we're allowed to raise. Um, so we have this opportunity not to raise the full levy limit, and the Board of Selectmen does not desire to do so, so we're proposing um, to stay uh, that amount shy of the levy, which will uh, incrementally um, keep the tax rate lower and tax bills lower for fiscal year 23 versus what it could have been. Then we have a series of transfers within the, the operating budget itself. As the Finance Committee knows, many town meeting members are familiar. Town meeting uh, sets the budget uh, for individual departments at um, the control areas of bottom lines for personnel costs and bottom line for general expenses for the acquisition of good and ser goods and services. So anytime we want to move funds from either uh, general operating expenses to personnel costs or vice versa, town meeting uh, needs to make that approval. So we're proposing several of those changes this evening and at town meeting. The first is uh, transferring uh, from uh, personnel costs, $24,000 within the public buildings budget to operating expenses, uh, transitioning from um, in-house employees to contracted cleaning services. The second is transferring funds uh, from various uh, aspects of the Department of Public Works 
to the flight fleet maintenance division budget, a total of $35,740.99. Fleet maintenance salaries for the establishment of the fleet maintenance foreman position. We're transferring, proposing to transfer $76,500. It's currently budgeted in the IT budget, which covers the um, um, business analyst's uh, salary uh, to the town manager's office to cover that same function, the, uh, the business analyst's salary. So the business analyst works out of the town manager's office. It was previously funded through the IT budget, but in order to uh, more align that with how we actually operate. We want to move it into the town manager's office. With uh, for the library, we propose to transfer um, four thousand one hundred and eighty dollars from salaries to operating expenses to cover uh, various services that we use in the absence of an employee. And the final item, which is uh, raising uh, from taxation seventy five thousand dollars, which is a portion of that. Uh, revenue that we've identified since this uh, May town meeting, $75,000 to the Finance Committee's Reserve Fund. The Finance Committee's Reserve Fund is really the only flexibility that we have in the budget throughout the course of the year outside of town meeting to augment individual budgets, and it remains under the control of the Finance Committee. Um, we see the need to do that this year because of the increase in uh, inflation uh, that we're seeing across many service lines and uh, goods that we're purchasing. This additional 75,000 will, will provide us with more flexibility to cover those increased costs throughout the course of the year. So we're just uh, seeking that opportunity. So these are the uh, six items that we're proposing to adjust through Article 4. Um, I have various staff members uh, here that would be able to assist me in answering questions that you may have. Any questions or comments from the committee? Yes, Dennis. Um, what was the incremental tax savings that we're going to get by not by using taxation money to move this around? Um, it, it should be around $25 for the average single okay. family tax bill. Any other questions, Melin? Um, do we know how does that split between the, the commercial taxation versus residential? So it, it will be the same. So we, we do have a single tax rate. Um, I don't have the average commercial bill in front of me. Um, generally, it would be a little bit higher um, since we have the, the same tax rate, but um, we can get that information for you. You have a follow? Ask yes, please. You know, I know there were, like, uh, uh, recently there were applications, you know, for our se senior citizens, you know, to mm -hmm. qualify. Does this impact any of the... It, it does not, no. Yep, no impact. We'll still offer those programs. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, from my board. yeah please. Just, Kevin, just under the, the last one on the Finance Committee, sure. um, do you have a formula or a baseline or a percentage you like to stay at for that? I know we're going to go from 230 to 305. Sure. Um, I'm just curious on that, if, if yeah. how you back into that number. Yeah, so we have a policy that um, we have set that we're well below, honestly, right now in the reserve fund. Our reserve fund as a percentage of the budget uh, is quite lower than it should be. Off the top of my head, I, I want to say that our uh, policy is roughly 3%, 3 to 5% of, of um the operating expenses, so we exclude personnel, we should be able to budget for those without extreme challenge. So um, I can get you a little bit more information, but I would say as a percentage, it's really, it's really a thin line item to be able to right. no, that's helpful. Uh, address. Can I follow up? Please. Um, and, and maybe a little premature, I was just curious if we're a little below now, do you know the last time maybe we were at that three to five, has it been a long time? It's been a long, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, you know, we had the opportunity to do that when we did the override, but if we can't survive the first few years without making budget right. adjustments right, after right. an override, when could we ever? So we didn't really want to put money into this line item, but um, I think this is a good opportunity yeah. to do that and maintain right. it. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah. Leanna, yeah. please. Um, so is this, this, is this like a like typical savings account and earning a little bit of interest or, or what is this? Because, you know, versus, you know, you may not want to have too much 
in there, you want to be able to have the rainy day fund, but you also don't want to be losing holding it there if there's a lot of inflation happening. So, right. So, this technically, really, in and of itself, isn't subject to any interest. Okay. Um, and um, I forget what was the other part. Was there another part of your question? No, it's just if, if it was earning any interest yeah. or anything like that. No, it is not. Any more questions from the board? If not, I, if not, I open it to the public. No questions from the public. Uh, thank you, Kevin. We can move to Article 5. So Article 5 seeks to add $47,810 to the General Stabilization Fund. So the General Stabilization is our kind of deepest saving rainy day account um, that we uh, are seeking to build to 5% of the annual operating budget. Our current balance, as you see on the screen, is a little over $3.8 million. It would raise it to three million eight fifty eight eight ten, taking it to 2.79% of the budget as proposed. Um, this is a number that has greatly increased over the last three years as we move towards the policy level of 5%. Um, under normal years, uh, in the, at the annual town meeting, we contribute free cash into this fund, so we take it from that reserve into a, a more stable and long-term general stabilization fund. This is truly an emergency fund that we would only tap into um, in extreme need, and it's really our goal, again, to get it to the 5% level. So uh, this is just an opportunity uh, to take an adequate portion of those additional revenues that were identified um, after the May town meeting and move it into the reserve. So just to add on to that, Kevin, it, this number of 47,810, it's the best we can do based on your analysis. Yeah, at this time, uh, we certainly have free cash, but we like to fr keep free cash as it is in the fall in case there's anything that comes up throughout the course of the year that we'd have to call a special town meeting for. Mm -hmm. With the amount that has been certified in free cash at this point, I would say there shouldn't be any issue with contributing the same amount or more than we did this year to the reserve from free cash, which was $750,000. But it, it's just better to keep it more flexible and free cash until we get to May. Questions from the board? Melinda. Kevin, is there a, a particular dollar amount in our mind that we want to keep it in this fund or a certain percentage? Yeah. We are, I, we are targeting in X number of years. Yeah, so I mean, I would like to con continue to contribute at least three quarters to a full million each year. Um, that should put us at our policy level uh, in with three more deposits into the account, so three more years max to get us to that level. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? If not, I open it to the public. Any questions from the public on Article 5? Yes, ma'am. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself, Your once again, your name, address, and precinct number. Sandy McManus, uh, Precinct 10, 398 Grafton Street. In the last few years, what has funds from the stabilization, uh, what, what have you used the money for? Uh, broken down a uh, police car or something like that? What, we what other emergency? We, we have not used any. We've been focused on getting it to the reserve level. Um, it would be a really, in my opinion, a really extreme unforeseen need uh, that comes to us um, in order to propose the use of the general stabilization fund. So it is really a savings account that we want to get to policy level and then just leave there uh, and continue to maintain at that 5% or greater level. Um, this is a key component that's reviewed during our bond rating uh, to ensure we have sufficient reserves on hand to maintain the, the rating that we have of AAA. So there haven't been any expenditures um, in the last five, but I would say eight plus years we probably haven't spent any. And you did mention this is a savings account, so we yes. do get interest. We do earn. Yes, we do. And, and the interest that's earned on the dollars in the stabilization fund are only returned to the stabilization fund. It doesn't go elsewhere. Any other questions from the public? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Carol Spine, Precinct uh, 6, uh, 7 Tavern Street. What's the difference between free cash, uh, stabilization fund, and the reserve fund? 
seems like they're all sort of extra funds in case we need them. But there's got to be a difference between three funds. Sure. Just, Just maybe. Yeah, sure. So they are all considered reserve assets of the community. So uh, to Ms. Swidean's questions, they are all very similar. Um, specifically, the general stabilization fund, uh, town meeting has to take action to build that up. Um, and it uh, requires a simple majority to put funds into, but it requires a super majority to take funds out of. So it was really established to be the deepest and most stable reserve. It's the true rainy day fund for unforeseen emergencies for the town to tackle. Um, historically, um, we've always been below the policy level, but we're really focused on getting to it. Free cash is very similar that it's a large reserve, but it's really um, a much more flexible account. Um, free cash is, as uh, Ms. Martinez said earlier, the, um, the unappropriated uh, balance at the end of the fiscal year, and it's made up of previous free cash amounts, uh, any excess revenues that we received that we did not anticipate in the given fiscal year, and any appropriations that we did not expend from that fiscal year. So uh, one primary difference between free cash is that uh, it requires only a simple majority ever to expend funds out of it. So it's much, in some ways, it's more liquid. Uh, finally, the reserve fund is an appropriated amount that comes in uh, and is established each and every year and is controlled by the Finance Committee to, uh, and they must vote to appropriate those funds out of their budget into other uh, departmental budgets. Um, and those are used for uh, according to statute, any unforeseen and unexpected expenses that arise during the fiscal year that were uh, not budgeted for. So the reserve fund is a single year asset of the town, uh, free cash, um, you know, builds over time if it's not expended. Uh, and general stabilization fund, again, is the deepest emergency rainy day fund um, that is only, can only be appropriated through a town meeting with a super majority vote. Any more questions from the public or the board? Yes. Basically, free cash, I mean, the, the reserve fund for the finance committee that allows us to keep things moving without having to call a town meeting yep. and address things more quickly than we would otherwise. Absolutely. But it's the smallest of the funds because we're not getting, we're not getting a lot of power. We're just getting the ability to keep, you know, yep. departments running. Absolutely. Thank you. And no more questions or comments. Uh, Kevin, we can move on to article number six, six, seven, and eight. Okay. We can talk about six, seven, and eight together. Um, happy to take any questions and handle them separately uh, as well. Uh, so these are all associated with um, various aspects of our public safety departments, uh, particularly police and fire. Uh, the first one in article six proposes the use of $710 from taxation to uh, supplement a state earmark that we received from Representative Kane and Senator Moore. This will cover the cost of enhanced physicals, uh, known as a life scan system for our firefighters. We received $24,500 for the state. This enhanced physical allows uh, documentation of the general health conditions of our firefighters, including ultrasounds. Um, and uh, is in response to the general higher uh, aspects of, of certain type of chronic diseases in, in the firefighting field. Um, Article 7 is $20,000 proposed to, to supplement uh, the insurance funds that we received for the replacement of a police cruiser that was totaled um, while operating. Uh, the difference uh, required or the difference is required because of two primary factors. One, when we insure our police cruisers, we insure them at the actual cash value rather than the full replacement cost. Uh, we do this because police cruisers um, have a short life of three years. Um, and knock on wood, it's rare that one is totaled and we need to replace it. Um, the second is um, we are, this was an, a traditional internal combustion engine uh, cruiser and we're now buying all hy hybrids and they're a little bit more expensive. So those two factors require the appropriation of additional funding to replace this cruiser. 
And Article 8 proposes the use of $35,000 in tax, $33,500 in taxation to fund a study for unified dispatching, mm -hmm. uh, staffing, and operations. So currently, uh, police operations and fire operations are dispatched separately. Uh, police operations are dispatched through uh, uh, dispatchers uh, who operate out of the police department and fire dispatching is done through a firefighter from the fire headquarters building. Um, as many towns have already moved, we propose moving to a unified dispatching system in the confines of the new police station. The vision for that would be a central uh, and independent uniform emergency communications department uh, that is neither within the police or fire department for, to allow for equitable and unified dispatch um, for both police, fire, and EMS operations. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I had a couple of questions. Um, Article 6, um, so the life scan system that we will be investing in, uh, how does that actually work? Are the firefighters, uh, which is a very good, uh, um, I think it's, it's a very good thing to do, but I was wondering, like, how does the system work and how are they, they are, how is their health basically monitored? Yeah. And so, is there some process? So this is actually a contract with a company to perform the life scan process. So it is an enhanced physical uh, and uh, ultrasound uh, type technology that's used by this company. The physical itself is NFPA, I think it's 1583 compliant, which is a very rigorous uh, physical for firefighters. Um, it will uh, be something that we would look to do on a regular basis, perhaps every five years for the benefit of our employees, but the employees will receive all this detailed information and they'll be able to share it with their own primary care physicians, uh, to put them on file to track and maintain any changes in the interim years. Um, this has been a very successful program. Um, many success stories throughout the country, including some locally where firefighters um, have gone through this process and um, chronic health conditions have been identified and treated very early. Do we come under any HIPAA sort of regulations as far as this information is concerned? We, it would all be compliant with HIPAA. Yes. Please, what's, what's the actual additional cost per physical for, for, life scan, for the life scan? Because I know we want we, if we do it once, we don't want to do it again. And it makes sense to, but. Gonna... It's six hundred and fifty dollars per firefighter. Okay. So we'll start seeing budgeting for that sure. every year, just yeah. to sort of build the money up and not get hit with a big, yep. big bill each year because we may not always get the right. Eight. Okay. Lena, please. Um, for Article Eight, so this funding is just to fund the study, and so do you have a time frame of what the integration would look like and how much that would cost? Sure. So we. Um, are proposing to move to unified dispatch tentatively July 1st of 2024. Uh, one factor associated with that is we need to negotiate with the fire union with regards to that. Um, we do anticipate um, roughly based on standards that we're aware of needing to increase from nine dispatchers to 18 to be able to fund uh, at least two dispatchers, two to three dispatchers per shift um, this is an incremental cost to the town because we, for dispatching operations, we receive significant state grants associated with each dispatcher that we have. This would also free up one firefighter that currently dispatches during a shift at fire headquarters to allow them to participate in fire suppression and other emergency response activities. But there will be an increased cost. And since it's to unify the police and the fire, would it be split between those two departments the cost it um, likely would be a, a separate cost so we would pull funds currently in the police department and add funds into a separate department called emergency communications okay any other question yeah, yeah i just wanted to piggyback on this question kevin so when we say fund the study and you may have just answered it we got to negotiate. Is that part of the study? Like I'm trying to distinguish what's the study going to do versus what we feel like we haven't in plan come. Sure. So the study itself is going to set the staffing levels that we need. They'll analyze total call volume for police, fire, and EMS calls. Um, they'll look at call volumes and total shift staffing associated with it. 
Uh, they'll analyze our ability to do emergency medical dispatch in-house, uh, or we need to continue to contract that out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll set standard operating procedures that will have input from both the police and fire chief. So police, as you can imagine, police and fire dispatching are really fall under dispatching, but are complete, two distinctly different types of actions. Um, so um, we'll rely upon a, an experienced firm to help set up those parameters with the equal input from both departments. Um, separate from that would be um, negotiation with the, the fire um, union to remove that responsibility from firefighters and place it in a separate department. From my preliminary conversations with union leadership, they, they're supportive of this because it gets them additional firefighter on their apparatus. Thank you. Sure. Are there any liability issues in terms of um, dispatch who shares the responsibility if we move it away from the firefighters? Um, it would not, no. Um, it would just be you know, through you know, professional trained dispatchers rather than a firefighter. It's much more ideal to, for a dispatcher to do it than it is for um, how we currently do it. Yeah, uh, Dennis. Yeah. You mentioned contract services for the emergency medical. Um, so if this goes through, we'll be removing those contract services? It depends. I think that's a, it's not a very high likelihood that we would, but it's something that we do want to explore. Um, we've seen time and time again, and we're actually facing it with ambulance services in general, where we have good relationships with UMass and things like that, but um, controlling our own destiny is something that we just want to see what that cost would be and, and what the cost benefit of it would be. So that's not part of the, eight, the 9 to 18 dispatchers that we're talking about? That would not be. And currently, how many total dispatchers between the, the two departments do we have? Um, in theory, so we have nine dispatchers in our dispatch union those are the ones associated in the police department yep. and then we have one firefighter dedicated for every shift in the fire department so that's equivalent to about four full-time equipment yep. ftes so we'll go from 13 to 18. yeah something like that right. and we'll get a firefighter per shift back. right any and questions on board um yeah uh, uh, on number seven, um, so you're uh, purchasing a, a hybrid vehicle instead of a, a standard combustion engine. Is that going? Is this a kind of trial, or is that going to be the the new standard that we're looking to do? It is the new standard. Okay. Uh, we have three or four hybrids already, um, so that that's all we're purchasing moving forward. Thank you. Sure. So this links into our sustainable strategic plan as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One question. Sure. How have the maintenance bills been on the hybrids versus the combustible, since the hybrids actually have two engines? Yeah, uh, they haven't been very different. Uh, we do have the first hybrid that we actually bought um, is being purchased back from us by Ford because we have had a lot of issues with it, but they're completely covering our entire out-of-pocket costs and we'll acquire another one uh, during that cycle. So we have had issues with just one of them. Okay. Any other questions from the board? I open it to the public, any member of the public who wishes to comment or question Article 6, 7, and 8. If not, uh, we can proceed to Article number 9, Kevin. Thank you. Um, article number 9 is associated with um, capital improvements uh, within the public buildings department. I have Assistant uh, DPW Director Keith Baldinger here to walk you through uh, this required additional funding and what the project entails. Good evening. Keith Fallinger, Assistant Director of Public Works. Um, so this project um, is at the Floral Street School. Um, this project is to replace five, um, ex five HVAC units that are original to the building, which is about 26 years at this point. Um, they service administration office, media center, and specialized classroom. Um, it's about 15, covers about 15,000 square feet of this building. These spaces are all both heated and cooled with these units. They're all at various states of end of life. Uh, um, so in, in FY23, we requested $100,000 for this project. Um, and the, the, that original request was to replace them or repair them in kind. Um, since then, we have uh, we had our design engineer designer involved. Um, and we worked with Selco 
and head us in the direction of full electrification, heat pump systems. They don't use any fossil fuel. Um, so we, we proceeded with designing it in that way um, because to replace a 25-year-old system with the same technology from 25 years old, 25 years ago, didn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so we put that project on the street for bid. It came back at $327,000 um, for the cost. Um, so therefore, we're asking for um, $185,000 more to fund this. Um, and the reason we're asking for it at this town meeting is uh, we'll be able to get this back on the street soon and then make this a summer project for next year because there are there is a four to six month lead time for for these units right now um, and like I said the the, uh, the new equipment fully electrified no fossil fuels um, it's a heat pump system it's more efficient uses less energy and will cost us less in utility bills what is the expected life of the system um, probably 15 to 20 years, we think. And another fun fact, um, the Floral Street School, believe it or not, has the oldest um, HVAC system in town now, because everything else is newer or been replaced. What was the, please, Dennis. What was the expected um, lifespan of the older system, which is now 26 years old? Probably about five years ago. Okay. So, so it's about, so we're getting roughly the same? Maybe a little bit less on the newer one? Correct. Okay. Diana, please. Uh, do we have any estimates on the utility cost savings? Um, not, we haven't dived into that quite yet, but our expectation is probably in the 10 to 15 cent uh, range. Okay. Yes. Which would be in dollars? Ooh, see, now you're hitting me. <laughs> well, it's the finance um, committee. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, would, I would guess, and I can certainly get you uh, much better numbers, um, but that building between fossil fuel and electricity um, averages probably about fourteen to $16,000 per month. Um, so, you know, if we save 10%, we'll save fifteen to $1,600. Okay, that's good. Any other questions from the board? Amelie? Is this bid that you talked about, like 387000 is this uh, inclusive of any rebate that we might get from, you know, mass sale of any So, um, actually, Selco has, um, so we so we have 100000 100, I guess I missed this part, we have $100,000 in capital from FY23. Selco has gives, giving us a $50,000 utility incentive towards this. Um, so, and then when you, the remaining of these funds will um, help pay for that, and we still have an opportunity with Eversource Gas that we may get a rebate. But we haven't fully. Um, I can't give you a real number on that. I don't. I don't. We don't know what it is at this point. Any other questions from the board? I open it to the public. Any questions on Article Nine from the public? If not, thank you, Keith. Uh, we'll move on to Article Number Ten. Article 10 uh, will be handled by Assistant Town Manager Kristen Lass. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, and you can you can sure. take it from. Good me. evening, everyone. I apologize for being late. I was over at the planning board meeting helping them this evening. Um, I'd also like to invite up uh, Principal Assessor Ruth Anderson, as she is better prepared to address this article. But she and I have been working congruently on this project. So, Ruth, if you want to come up. Okay, if I sit. Yeah. Mike, we'll get, uh, you can sit here if you want. Well, that's all right. I'll stand. Good evening, I'm uh, Ruth Anderson. I'm your, currently serving as your principal assessor. So this Article 10 is um, to address some challenges that are not unique to Shrewsbury. They're um, being faced by communities across the Commonwealth and regarding addressing. Some of the current challenges we're facing in Shrewsbury include streets that have similar names, out of order street numbering, and common driveways that are essentially private streets with no unique identifier. The most um, pom uh, famous one at Town Hall is 935 Main Street. It's got one street address, 26 units off of a common driveway. There are also several instances where streets have similar names, as in Walnut Street, Walnut Place, Walnut Hill, Walnut Hill Lane, and Walnut Drive. From a public safety standpoint, you can Im imagine the challenges to EMS. Someone calls 911 and says they're on Walnut. 
In Shrewsbury, there's never been a central table that's been managed by one specific department. So inconsistencies have continued over the years, leading to potential public safety issues and confusion when developers propose new projects. Departments that utilize addresses, which is essentially every department at Town Hall, have developed their own workflows and procedures to assign and collect address information in ways that are optimized for their specific department. And the challenges arise when those programs don't always play nicely together when the, when the information needs to be combined. So the need to update this process was identified several years ago and a working group was created to develop policies and a routine process to avoid future challenges. In the last year, we've used $7,000 of ARPA funds to prepare a needs assessment, which was completed in January. And we've begun to implement the changes based on the recommendations of that study, but we've only scratched the surface. And this article asks to raise and appropriate $100,000 from taxation for the development of a primary address table along with the parameters for future address assignment, utilizing a consulting firm that will assist with identification of our problem areas in the current process in Shrewsbury, as well as develop new processes to be implemented and create a system that works for all departments, most specifically assessing, building with permitting, DPW, the town clerk's office, and CELCO. So I'm happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, I have one question uh, on the PAT, the, the primary address table. So uh, the budget that you're requesting, um, does this include just a study into what is to be done, what could be done, a system, or actually creating some sort of system that maintains it? It's going to create the system. It's okay. going to study what we have okay. and make recommendations and develop an addressing policy and a manual as well as the table itself, and then provide us training on how to maintain that so that it stays, so that we don't run into these issues down the road. So, uh, Ms. Anderson, when you say a manual, is this a sort of an online system or like in the cloud or is it some printed Honestly, system? I'm not sure if it's going to be cloud-based or if okay. it's going to be a database that sits on a server. Mm -hmm. um, by manual, I, I mean how to basically have a gatekeeper who is the one primary source for addressing and train that person or department so that we have a consistent system throughout the town. Dennis. Um, how is it going to address the current inconsistencies? Are we talking about renaming streets, renumbering streets, or just identifying where those issues are so when someone calls in they can find it more quickly? Identifying first, of course, um, changing a street name or even renumbering certain properties, people, especially if it's a residence, is a really big undertaking yep. um, that involves, I mean, just think of it every time you move, you have to change your address with all of your banks and contacts and all of that kind of thing. So to have the town do that, that's not in our plan that, at this point. That's what I thought, but I'm just trying to figure out if we already have all these issues, are we just preventing future issues or is there a way to address these $100,000 I would hope we could address some of the current issues which we declared as safety ha possible safety hazards. So that was my I, question. I would hope that through their, through the, whichever company is helping us with this, that they can give us some advice on and guidance on how to address those issues especially from a public safety issue. That, to me, that's the biggest concern. Right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Diana. Um, do you have any anticipated change in like ongoing costs? Or is this your, your everybody's doing their own and, and now it's the responsibility of somebody else? Do you see any changes in any ongoing costs with this, with this model shift? Just so I'm clear, do you mean are there going to be additional costs or cost savings because you've now theoretically simplified this instead of every department maintaining their own, you've, you've now made one central thing. Um, I might defer to Kristen, but just off the top of my head on that, I would think um, 
dollar savings, maybe not, but time savings, of course, um, which could then translate to better efficiencies across the board. Not, I don't know if Chris would have anything to add. I can just add to that. I, I definitely agree with uh, Ms. Anderson's comment. Um, I would say that we can't guarantee that there would not be any future costs because there might be an integration cost with one software over another related to creating those addresses, putting them together, but I see those more as a one-time cost of integrating that, and then once we have the system running, it should run pretty smoothly. But I don't wanna say that there will definitely be no future costs. Part of the study will help us how we are integrating these addresses into our multiple software systems that we use related to addresses. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, response so will we know what that integration will look like after the end of this study yes that is part of the study it's going to be the integration as well yes. any other questions Lena uh, is there another town that has gone through this process and what has their implementation like results like what is their process look like sure so I'll go first and then if you have anything yeah, okay. I know that the city of Worcester is currently going through this process they're a much larger uh, municipality so uh, we don't know the outcomes yet, but they are seeing some successes with that. I don't know if Ms. Anderson has some other uh, towns that have worked on this. I don't know any off the top of my head that I've worked on it, but I do know that talking with colleagues that, like I said earlier, addressing is a big problem. As we get more, um, each department has their own software and their own system that works for them. They develop their own parameters for things, and it's inconsistent so that when they try to so when my department tries to talk to the building department, so to speak, our, they don't always speak the same language. So this would unify all the departments? Yes. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. A any other questions from the uh, I can, board? If I could just add. Please. Uh, <clears throat> we do know younger cities and towns that spring up in other parts of the country that aren't New England based and haven't been around for several hundred years start with a master address table and a system as they annex or create themselves to, you know so in some ways we're catching up um, but it is prevalent throughout the country and local government it's kind of a best practice but we've got to back into it which makes it a little bit harder it and i'll just admit i mean it's super behind the scenes right it's it's not a you know you know shiny public service that you know residents are going to see touch and feel but it's really essential for our operations Understood. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, Diana, please. Um, so will this go out to a bid process once this is approved? Okay. Thank you. Any more questions from the board? Uh, I will open it to the public. Any member of the public who wishes to comment or question Article 10? Yes, ma'am, please. Please, the, you know the... the Ritual. <laughs> repeat or offend it here. Sandy McManus, Precinct 10, uh, 398 Grafton Street. Well, this happened to us maybe about 10 years ago. We have a camp up in Moultonboro, New Hampshire, and the ambulance showed up at Place Parande, so that was our name of our street, and Pernanda Street. So the next summer we came back, and my street sign was gone and now we're snowy street <laughs> end of story no money new street sign thank you any other comments from the public if not we shall move oh, oh yes sir sorry i missed you tony bonaventura 120 hour so uh, your precinct number as well sir I, I don't know off the top of my head actually okay Four. 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 <laughs> I know where to go, but I don't know the number off. Um, so my question would be like three or four examples of what this correct would correct like maybe over the last year. And uh, secondary that this sounds like a hundred thousand dollar investment to get more information about it. I'm not sure that everybody understands exactly what what um, the town would be choosing to get. Like, it sounds like, from the questions I hear, that the people that are voting on this are having trouble understanding exactly um, what this is going to do. So, I guess my first question would be um, some examples, like three or four examples over the past year. 
Uh, Ms. Anderson or Ms. Lass, could you? But I would just say, Ruth, you don't have to answer the, whether the finance committee knows or not. They can ask, answer their, ask their own questions, but we certainly have examples. Okay. So the, uh, as I said earlier, the primary example that we talk about a lot is 935 Main Street. Um, it's essentially a common driveway with 26 houses on it. So that's not good practice across the board because it's one address with unit numbers so public safety addressing all of that is um, overly complicated so developing a process would prevent that from happening again so as Kristen said earlier we don't know that this is going to fix anything that's a problem already because in a sense essentially what's done is done but it will give us a standard and a process to follow so that those things don't happen in the future. And then once we're on good footing, then maybe we can go back and look at things that, street numbers that are out of order or street names that are too similar and are causing a public safety issue. I can also add to that. So um, we generally uh, find in the building inspector's office might have a different address than the fire department has online, than has uh, in the DPW. And bills are going to different addresses and the public safety are going to different addresses. Um, we have identified that through that needs assessment that we spent $7,000 on. So we know what we need to study. And it won't actually be a study. It will be the process. We know. Um, that we need to have a process. We know that we're not experts in that, so we'll be going out. There are certainly experts in that. We have several firms that we know that we're gonna go out to bid. To. So we have our needs assessment. We know what we need to do. We now just need to do that and put it in place. But um, time and time again, we have collective meetings with myself, the building inspector, the assessor, uh, the DPW departments um, with these problem addresses and also creating the new addresses. And we have tried to come up with a solution, but we're not experts in that. So um, again, I won't, I won't be the head, dead horse, but we know what our needs are and that's what we're writing the RFP for. And we have that cost estimate of about $100,000 to do that. Okay, I, I won't speak for the whole finance committee. But my understanding is it's a study, you come up with a process, and they're going to implement something. So that way it's not just a study you're paying for. We should have a solution that is implementable, repeatable, and move forward. And if nothing else, this will save an amount of time between the administration offices, I don't know, 10 hours a year, 100 hours a year? I, I don't know that, but which also is a savings to the town in that you can use that money somewhere else. But this is not just a study. It's, it's a real problem. And this is a solution. Now, will it fix the old stuff? I wish it would. I mean, that would be one thing I wish we could do. But hopefully coming out of the study, there will be some firm recommendations, such as maybe rename streets or maybe renumber houses. Um, you know, but if nothing else, we'll get a process that will be followed. So, to answer the other gentleman's question, I do know what they were talking about. So. Yeah, John. Oh, great. I have a good example, and it all depending on when a project starts. So if a project starts with the building inspector's office, they may actually, oh, I'm sorry, Jeff Holland, DPW director. Uh, if a project starts with a water or sewer service first, let's say they were paving, like we paved Main Street, and the developer wanted to come in and put the services in long before he knew what was going to be doing with the property, so the permitting system that was submitted was for a certain, a different address. Well, when it went to the planning, uh, building department for a building permit, and then it came back upstairs to extend the, that water and sewer services, we couldn't find it, they couldn't find it, and then it took us weeks to figure out what actually happened and what permitting, because it, it, depending on when the permit was actually filed. And, and we've been talking about this for a while of how do we come up with a system where we're all on the same page so that Ruth, when Ruth issues her, the actual legal address, it's not different than the address that water and sewer may have provided or that actually the contractor provided when he applied for his original permit. Then he applies, then a new contractor comes in and applies for a different, or say the building permit under a different address because they don't know what it is. And then we, it just becomes, and once it's in the system, we can't go back and change the, the address. 
it, once it's in our permitting system, it's very difficult for us to change the address. If we can correct this long before we ever get there, which is the reason what we're, reason we're trying to do this. So then how do you actually resolve that? Do you have to go and create it again? We do it on paper. Do it on paper. Which is not ideal. <laughs> and unfortunately, we remember now, it's 10 years from now when someone doesn't remember that, and I'll, I'll pick on 935 Main, but not, no one's gonna remember 10 years from now, 935 Main Street, how the permits were issued. And someone wants to go in and pull another permit on that same building, may not, we'll never may be able to go back and find the historic records. So we're trying to correct how to, how we actually move forward. Any other comments from the board, anybody? Thank you, Mr. Holland. Um, any other questions or comments from the public? If not, we can move on to article number 11. Kevin. Article 11 is the fund uh, expansion, uh, fund the design of the expansion um, for the Mountain View Cemetery, uh, which will be across the street at 65 Prospect Street. And uh, DPW Director Holland will uh, lead us through this proposal. Again, for the record, Jeff Holland, DPW Director. Uh, we are looking f for the design fees of $200,000 to design the first phase of the cemetery on Prospect Park. Uh, the little timeline is, is up on the, uh, the project timeline, but the town purchased the proper, property in 1976. Uh, at the same town meeting, they established a Masonic Home Study Committee, which looked at the entire property, which is known as now Prospect Park. In 1979, they made a recommendation to town meeting, which was accepted by town the, their annual town meeting in 1979, to designate what is now known as 65 Prospect Street or Prospect Park for a future cemetery water purposes which if you know there's two water tanks up on the up on that property now recreational purposes and at that time for the potential of housing um that is at later town meetings was eliminated as the town went in and removed the old uh, uh structure that was up there but originally the initial thought was actually to put affordable housing in that building uh there has been subsequent town meeting that that is uh, over the years that has affirmed the use as a future cemetery. Uh, so uh, it, even as late as 2019, which the town meeting funded uh, the design of a concept plan, over the past several years we've had uh, new or several uh, informational Zoom meetings with the uh, architect, landscape architect. Uh, and we've come up with a proposal and the project or the uh, request now is to fund the design. Uh, I will like to say, so currently at the existing cemetery, we have between six and eight years left uh, in which at this point, the cemetery commission is only issuing or selling graves on an as needed basis, uh, which is if you pass away, they will sell you a grave, not before because they just don't have the space. Uh, to put in perspective, as I said, we have six to eight years left, and that's based upon the last five-year average of, of uh, graves that we have sold. It'll take about a year to do the design, about a year to go through the permitting, in between two and three years to, for the construction of the access drives and the grave sites. That leaves us from the date that we anticipate this to be ready for burials, We'll have between one and three years left on on, on the existing cemetery. So there is 157 available spaces left. And how many will we be creating as a result of this? This first phase creates uh, somewhere in, uh, around 3,200. Which we expect for will suffice for how long? For approximately 50 years. Dennis, oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Lena. I was just going to ask, um, would you be able to buy these spaces ahead of time? So, so I can't speak for the uh, Cemetery Commission, but that's the anticipation, yes. We, we stopped that practice now because we, at the rate that we were going, we actually would have already been sold out. 
Dennis. Um, Prospect Park currently is a park used by a lot of people. We have what percentage of the park is going to be taken up by this, and how close to like where the water towers are is. I don't know if you have the slide. If you could show where the water towers are and where Phase One, Phase Two are. Yeah. So this, the the area of this is less than a quarter of the whole park. Okay. Uh, you see the upper right hand corner, which is a circle. Yeah. That is the that will be a proposed parking lot for the park, not for the cemetery. The little bump out coming off of Prospect Street, which runs on your right-hand side of that plan, where you, the drive entrance that comes in, and that little bump out uh, go up right there, that is about where the existing gate is. Okay, so that's the existing entrance. That's the existing entrance. The tanks are probably, oh, if I kept going up, it's probably in somewhere about halfway up the second floor. Yeah, and it's over to the, they're on the right yeah, side of the road. Yeah, that's up. Okay. And in phase one, is this phase one here, how far is this all the phases that are showing up on the map right now? This is phase one. Phase one? Correct. So where would phase two, maybe I'll be gone before that happens, but where would phase two come into? Phase two, I, I, I don't point, but I believe it's actually on the lower side above that parking space, but I'm not 100% positive. I, I can get that for you. We, we do have a plan, but it's like a 200-year plan, but yeah. none of us will. will I'm asking part for personal reasons. I use that park almost yep. every day. I know in four or five years, part of it's going to be missing. Actually, the part where the beaver lives and has attacked a few dogs, that's gone. That'll be good. But, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out, will I still be here by the time you get up to where I am, where, where I use the park? So it sounds like you won't. Oh. Uh, the type of park is not a traditional park. Yeah. So I don't know if you went to any of the uh, public meetings that we had. I have. It, it, this park is intended to be more of a passive park, a cemetery rather, uh, which is going to be very walkable. It's not going to be like uh, we, uh, Mountain View is now, where it's rows and rows and rows of cemetery plots. These will be intertwined with amongst the trees, the rocks, the outcroppings, the stone walls that are there. Et cetera, and to be more passive. Okay. So a lot of uh, community community members use that park for walking their pets. Would that affect them in any sort of way? The building of the cemetery. They will be allowed to walk in the cemetery. Okay. Uh, currently, I believe there's a restriction at the current cemetery, but we do see dogs over there, and I think the idea here is not to have that same restriction. But again, that's a cemetery commission. Discussion. Any other questions from the board? If not, I open it to the public. Any member of the public who wishes to comment or ask questions in Article 11? Uh, so I'm sorry, is, Diana. Yeah. So this is just the the next phase of of the design. This doesn't cover any cost of any work that would be done. That would come later. That is correct. Okay. I can just add to that. Just to provide as much as we can and what we know this evening, we're anticipating a construction cost around $5 million for this. Um, we believe the design would be done in sufficient, a time, sufficient amount of time for us to request funding as soon as the annual town meeting in May, given Director Howland's comments about uh, the narrow window, window of one to three years, which would be remaining based on current estimates. We do want to keep this moving as soon as possible. Uh, we would be seeking some type of debt service uh, to cover that five to six million dollar cost. Um, preliminary conversations with the Board of Slackman would try to do that within the current tax rate without having to increase taxes. Yes, please. Um, with the new cemetery plan, is there going to be any incentive for cremations so that we're not doing full burials, you know, setting up either much lower rates for, for people that cremated? And I know they set up, you know, areas for cremations this cemetery will have come will have all so there'll be yeah. there is there will be the um, niches like there is now they will be in ground also for cremations but also, also full burials uh, the Parks and Cemetery Commission has not discussed rates that will probably come up as 
they move forward with this project here. I'm He's just thinking, you know, eventually we'll run out of land. Shrewsbury's not getting any smaller. I'm um, just thinking, of, are we thinking forward to try to reduce the number of actual land needed for burials? There are a lot of people that would get cremated. You know, they can get a full burial spot, but maybe that gets changed. Right, so this does actually, it's actually, it's an industry, or I shouldn't say industry. It is actually a culture change in which there are more cremations than there used to be, realizing that a cremation in a full burial plot is kind of a waste of space. So, but this uh, new cemetery actually has spaces that it will be designed for those smaller uh, areas. But you could still get a full one, right? That is correct. So that's kind of what I'm saying is, do we need a full one for a cremation? I, I, I and, think the and, idea and is- Can we think about that stuff going forward? Because using our, our limited public space for burials, as much as we can make it walk, walking friendly and everything else, doesn't seem like the best interest of this town from everything I hear from it, all my, you know, I'm a t town meeting member as well from my town meeting, you know, who I represent. So. Right. right, from our landscape architect, the, there is a cultural change also, yeah. which is again going in that direction. So we are following that same direction. But can we push it? <laughs> That's my question. Oh, my we can do our best. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I already requested the public. Uh, so I, there are no more questions on Article 11. We can move to Article 12. Thank you, Jeff. Kevin? Thank you. I can handle this article. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Again, Kristen Lass, Assistant Town Manager. Um, we were approached by the landowner at 32 Old Colony Drive, and you do have an exhibit in your packet uh, where that is located. It's quite a large parcel of land, um, and they would like to gift the town approximately 3.5 acres of land uh, and designate a, that as open space. Um, this land that they are looking to gift the town of Shrewsbury is actually located adjacent to an existing town of Shrewsbury property that is 3.5 acres that is primarily wetlands. Um, and currently the town of Shrewsbury property is landlocked. There's no way for the public to actually access that land. If the town were to accept this gift, um, it is actually accessed through an easement off of Sword Street, so there would actually be public access to this land. So if you look at the exhibit on the screen and in your packets, um, the land at 32 Old Colony is entirely in brown, uh, and the brown dotted line surrounds that. The piece of land that the property owner is looking to gift the property to is hatched. Uh, the town of Shrewsbury land is in green, and there's a 50-foot access easement off of Sword Street in that location. So again, this meets our strategic planning priorities uh, that are currently in draft form and under review as um, active and passive recreation and preserving open and natural spaces and protecting natural resources. There would be no cost to the town at this time uh, as it would be a gift and we see uh, minimal if no cost in the future uh, as we see this remaining open space. It is proximate to wetlands and uh, most likely would not have any uh, active structures located on it. Yes. No other way to put this, but what is in it for the landowner donating it? And look at this large Dave. parcel of land. Is he going to be breaking that up into housing units? Sure. And if he weren't to donate this land, would we have a say over how many housing units he can donate? Sure. Or build, I mean? So I've been actually working with this landowner for almost 10 years now, and they have actually looked at doing a large subdivision on the property, uh, connecting the Sword Street access easement down to Old Colony. Um, there are wetlands challenges there, but they could have built a substantially larger subdivision. Uh, what they're looking to do now is potentially uh, site four frontage lots off of Old Colony Drive. Um, the owner of the property has expressed that they have a huge interest in open space in the town of Shrewsbury. Uh, they have currently moved out of town, but they, uh, when they lived here for a very long time, greatly uh, used Dean Park and other open space properties, so they do want to give back to the town. Uh, so we see this as a positive a aspect, and it also reduces the number of housing units that could potentially be put on this property. Is there any chance of an easement 
from the old colony footage there into the park so you can come to it from two, two different ways? We asked the uh, owner that. They were not willing to do that. Um, so we did find that we actually had that town of Shrewsbury access easement that we feel will be sufficient. Given that it's a wetland, are there any environmental concerns that could come and sting us later in future? We see this as historically being wetland, and we don't see any uh, environmental concerns at this point in time. Any other questions from the board? If not, I'll open it to the public. Any member of the public who would wish to ask any question or comment on Article 12? Mm -hmm. If not, uh, thank you, Kristen. We can move on to Article 13, which is the last in our agenda today. Great. Uh, Article 13 is seeking approval from town meeting to acquire and fund the acquisition of a portion of uh, land that was formerly a part of 12 Chase Terrace. This is roughly a 5,200 acre square foot lot that is vacant within the town center. If you're not familiar with Chase Terrace, it runs parallel to Wesleyan Street um, and is adjacent, this property directly abuts 1 through 7 Maple Avenue, the former Beale School. Um, the town sees the opportunity to acquire this parcel of land for the construction of public parking and to improve pedestrian mobility and connectivity within the town center. We're seeking the use of $200,000 uh, to fund this uh, piece of land either uh, by fee or through eminent domain. Would there be basically, this, this is just the cost of the land, additional cost for construction, whether it's parking lots or anything would be later? Right, this is just for the acquisition of the yeah. land. The land was put on the market um, a little less than two weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, and it has been um, sold from the original entity that put it on the market at that time. The town identified itself as a willing buyer for the property, but they did still choose to close with another buyer. Um, so we'll engage with that other buyer um, and attempt to negotiate the acquisition of the property from them. Is it pot potential residential property that we're going to be converting into? Uh, um, this, Kristen can probably answer it in better detail. So this property falls within our town center zoning district, which we adopted in 2020. So this property could accommodate a single family dwelling unit, a multifamily dwelling unit, or a commercial mixed use. Uh, property as well. Do we know what the transaction cost when he sold it was? $165,000. Okay. And we could take it by eminent domain if, if need be, which I'm not saying we should, we should bid on it, but. we Yes, we are requesting town meeting provide authorization to take it by eminent domain if we cannot negotiate a, a, a fee simple acquisition of it. We feel it's a, a critical piece to the a vision that we have for the town center that was developed through the town center visioning process and associated with the redevelopment of one through seven maple avenue again providing additional parking and pedestrian mobility that's one of the biggest complaints about the town center right now is there's no parking so right. and that's in a pretty nice spot for the town center to park okay. so is this something to do with the bill project as well it's immediately adjacent to the bill project so this property is the second property in off of uh, Maple Avenue uh, behind the multifamily dwelling that's currently there. Um, so it provides great opportunity for opening that access up closer to the, the Hale Block buildings and, and other uh, businesses in the town center. Understood. Any other questions from the board? Uh, Lena? I'm just thinking, so when we sold the Beale School, the old Beale School, so we lost that parking. So is this to try to replace the parking that we lost with that cell? Do you want to talk about so that? we haven't uh, closed on that transaction yet, but in the negotiations that the Board of Selectmen made with that developer that are still moving forward, mm -hmm. there will be 20 public parking spaces on that property, mm -hmm. as well as 11 spaces along Haskell Avenue, so street parking as mm -hmm. well. Um, so we are losing in sense all of the BL parking, but we are instituting 20 spaces that were not there originally. So um, this would offset if we were to choose to use it for parking. Yeah. Yeah, just from a strategy perspective, let's say another property came online. Was, when we look at that as well, 
if you saw something tomorrow post in that same vicinity? Uh, we do. Um, perhaps, um, you know, this is something that the Board of Selectmen has discussed whenever they reviewed this property. Um, there is general interest in that area. And while we don't have a full written strategy, uh, we intend to put one in place over the, in the, over the coming months. Um, my personal opinion, stepping away from what the Board of Selectmen may think at, at this moment, um, I, I wouldn't think that there's any more strategic acquisitions along this uh, western portion of Chase Terrace, but if something on the eastern portion of Chase Terrace that would actually further open up our connectivity kind of one block back from Maple Avenue, that would be something that I would advocate for as well, yes. Okay. So I'll follow up. Have we ever recently done anything by eminent domain? Nothing like this, um, but yes. So, um, you know, when we did the Route 20 expansion project, uh, we, we uh, took some, pro some aspects, portions of lot by eminent domain for the roadway expansion project. Um, anytime we take an easement, we technically take it by eminent domain. So we clear the record, ensure that no prior lien holders have any um, prior position or better position than the town does. Um, this would be, I don't know when the last time I did it, but as a standalone parcel of land for not adjacent to a roadway, this, this would be um, something different than we have done in the recent past. Yeah, I think in the prior past, we heard that um, when the Coolidge School was being built, that there was eminent domain takings related to that school construction. One follow-up. Um, from what the current owner paid for the property and what you're budgeting for, there is room there that he will come out whole and more with that amount of money. So we hopefully won't have to go to eminent domain. There's a good chance that we can, that he's not going to lose money on his last transaction. That was our, that, yeah, that's our intent. That's yes. the intent, which the, is why we're asking for the amount of money we're asking for. The property was originally listed for 150000 He paid one sixty five, but yep, yeah. exactly as you said. So, that's our intent. So it's not like we're out with the intent. We're just going to take this property. We are going to you know, in good faith, try to do what's right for the town. Does eminent domain ever lead to legal challenges that could get us stuck in court? There's, there's, there's two types of challenges that could be levied through eminent domain taking. One is um, if there isn't an uh, inherent governmental purpose for the land, but economic development, public parking, and pedestrian access is an inherent governmental, so we don't see any challenges there. The second is the value of the land. And since this was uh, an arm's length transaction that just closed on Tuesday of this week, we feel that we accurately know the value of the land. So I wouldn't see a challenge from the cost perspective either. So um, that doesn't mean they won't file suit, but I think our legal risk on this is, is very minimal. Any other questions from the board? If not, I'll open it to the public. Any member of the public who wishes to comment or question Article number 13. Yes, sir, please. Tony Bonaventura, 120 How Ave, Precinct 4. Um, I'm not sure if it's an appropriate uh, place to ask the question, but so the, the Beale property. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing soon at 9 p.m. Please bring any items you may wish to check out to the self checkout stations or service desk on the first floor. The children's room is now closed for checkout. The desk for new library cards is also closed at this time. If you're working on one of our public computers, please save your work now. Please proceed. So, um, in my understanding, the, the bail property adjacent to this um, was sold not too long ago, um, and that had parking or potential for more parking and that property was sold and now we're buying the adjacent piece of property or proposed to buy that piece of property that's much smaller and i'm just wondering like is that part of the strat the initial strategy it, what was the benefit to selling a larger piece of property for i think a similar amount of money and not a not a big difference um to downsize to a smaller piece of property what was the strategy behind that so um, as Ms. Law said, the property hasn't closed, but it's still going through the permitting uh, process in accordance with the land disposition agreement between the Board of Selectmen and Civico Greenlee. 
Uh, the agreed upon sales price for that was uh, $250,000, and this is $165,000 that this property recently transferred, uh, transferred hands for. So really two separate, completely separate, unsimilar approaches. Uh, the redevelopment of 1 through 7 Maple Avenue is the creation of a mixed-use development that will garner nearly $20 million worth of private investment and help us move towards the vision of the town center of revitalizing it, making it a more vibrant place. This acquisition is subsequent to the development of the vision for that property itself to help augment additional property. So it's, it's certainly uh, related to 1 through 7. Um, but, you know, completely different. Again, we, we are looking to add parking spaces for the benefit of the overall town center. Um, we were not looking to do that at 1 through 7 Maple Avenue, just create a parking lot. Instead, we're looking to get over $20 million of private investment into that site. Any other comments from the board for those? Um, yeah. On the Beale property, they are also picking up any tab for any cleanup the removal of the building, et cetera, which could go from anywhere from $500,000 to maybe over a million. So it's, that is part of what we sold that building for. We do not have to take that down. We do not have to remove it. We don't have to, if there's any hazardous material, any leftover asbestos, we, we are not on the hook for that. The developer is. That's correct. So it, the $200,000 is not the real story on the cost. Correct. Any other comments from the board or any questions from the public? If not, uh, we have completed our uh, all the articles. So uh, if there are no other further um, comments or questions, I will ask for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. A second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The public hearing is now closed. Thank you. We shall now move to our deliberation section in which we will deliberate over the articles that we just discussed. Let's go first to article number one. Question and comments, any comments from the board? This is the dog control law. If there are no questions or comments, do I get a, a, a motion to accept Article 1? So moved. Second? Thank you. Mr. Chair, are you could just uh, uh, to recommend? So I'm sorry, yep. I realized that later. Yep. Could I get a motion to recommend Article 1? So moved. Any second? Okay. The, the motion passes. Oh, no, sorry, I have to. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Mr. Chair, uh, for Article 1 and 2, I was not here, so I'm going to abstain from both of those. Okay. But when you do the count. Duly noted. Thank you. The motion passes 7 to well, 6 to 0. Article 2, any comments or qu uh, discussion points on Article 2? This was basically related to handicapped parking and the increase in the, the penalty. So do I get a motion to recommend the passage of Article 2? So moved. Any second? Second. All in favor of recommending Article number 2, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. And the motion passes. We shall now move on to Article number 3. This is basically the Town of Shrewsbury Tree Bylaw that had to be updated. Any uh, discussion points anybody wishes to raise? If not, uh, do I get a motion to recommend passage of article number three? So moved. And a second? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no, nay. The motion passes. We now move to article number four. This is the article to appropriate funds uh, on various departments, all from taxation. Uh, any questions? Anybody wants to discuss anything on this? 
Or should we proceed to the vote? Do I get a motion to recommend article number four? So moved. Do I get a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say nay. The article passes. We now move to article number five. Yes, article number five. This is the article to uh, transfer money to the general stabilization fund. Uh, any questions, any comments on article number five that we wish to discuss? If not, do I get a motion to recommend the passage, recommend the passage of article number five? Move so to recommend the passage of article five. Second. Second. If all in favor of recommending passage of article number five, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. The motion passes. Article number six. Did we do these together? No, we didn't. Article six, uh, this is for the firefighter physicals. Um, do we have any questions or any discussions on article number six? If not, do I get a, a motion to recommend the passage of article six? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please please say nay. Article six passes. Article seven, which is related to the replacement of a police cruiser. Uh, do we have any questions, any discussion points on this article? If not, do I have a motion to recommend the passage of article seven? So moved. A second? Second. All of in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. The motion passes. Article number eight, which was to raise uh, money for the Unified Dispatching, Staffing, and Operations Study. Any questions, any discussion points that the board wishes to uh, take up on article number eight? If not, do I get a motion to recommend the passage of Article 8. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor of the passage of, recommending of the passage of Article 8, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. And the, part, the article recommendation passes. Uh, article number nine, this was to uh, the Floral Street uh, HVAC uh, repair. Uh, article. Any questions or comments to discuss article number nine? If not, may I have a motion to recommend the passage of article number nine? So moved. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor of recommending the passage of article nine, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. The article, the, the recommendation unanimously passes. Article number 10. This is for the primary address table, the funding for that. Uh, do we have any questions, any comments, any discussion points on this particular article? I just have one comment. I just sure. want to make sure that you know, the success criteria is, you know, like the, the public safety concerns are explained well you know i know there were discussions around it and that might come up in a town meeting may i have your attention please the library will be closing in 15 minutes if you have items you need any to other house, comments or questions to the self checkout stations or circulation desk located on the first floor if you're using a cruise we'll just segment, wait for this announcement please pick up your id or library card from the reference desk now do i get a motion to recommend the part the passage of article Ten. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor of recommending the passage of Article 10, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. And the article uh, and the motion passes. Article number 11, which was basically for the cemetery expansion design project. Uh, do we have any questions, any comments to discuss Article number 11? If not, do I have a motion to 
recommend the passage of Article 11. So moved. A second? Second. All in favor of the recommending the passage of Article 11, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. The motion so passes. Article number 12, which is the um, acquiring the gift portion of 32 Old Colony Drive. <clears throat> Do we have any questions, any comments, or any discussion points? Anybody wishes to bring up <clears throat> related to Article 12? If not, may I have a motion to recommend the passage of Article 12? So moved. And do second. I have a second? Yep. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Article, the, the recommendation for Article 12 so passes. Article number 13, our final article of the night. Um, any discussion points? Any Anything anybody wants to bring up? And discuss with the board, Dennis. I just want to clarify: this is this came up after the Beal was closed, and you saw the property that came up for sale. So that's why this has been put on the on the ballot. It's, it's not something that was in the works for a long time. It's just an opportunity that's come across come up for us to right. improve the, access the, in the town. At the yes, if, if I may. please. Uh, at the time that the board of selectmen signed the land disposition agreement on one to seven Maple Avenue, this was still a combined lot with a house adjacent to it. It was recently just split. Uh, and creating the open open parcel that we're now seeking to acquire. So I do have a question, if I may. Sure, sure. Um, well, so we're only buying the open land. We're not purchasing the home. That's correct. Okay, great. That was my one concern. So. Are there any other questions or comments on Article 13? Well, just a comment. Uh, um, I think we'll expect a lot of um, confusion related to the Beale project and, and um, its relation with this. So um, maybe if that could be explained a little bit more, the way Kevin, you the the the, um, the great explanation you gave, I think it should be in the article as well, yeah. or at least in a description. We'll, we'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. So if there are no more questions or comments on Article Thirteen. Uh, do I get a motion to recommend the passage of Article 13? So moved. Do I get a second? Second. All in favor of recommending a passage of Article 13, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. And the recommendation so passes. And that completes uh, our deliberations on the special town uh, the special town meeting warrant if there are no more comments or any uh, concerns or any objections may I get a motion to close the deliberation so moved may I get a second second all in favor of closing the deliberations on the, the special town meeting warrant for October 17 2022 please say aye. aye aye all opposed please say nay the motion so passes. We shall now move on to the next uh, um, item on our agenda, which is to review the meeting schedule. So October 17th, 2022, we have our special town meeting at the Oak Middle School. Uh, as you can see, 6.45 p.m. is the time uh, all board members should convene um, at on stage. So please do make a note of that. Uh, the following dates are November 17th, 2022. <coughs> December 15th, 2022, and January 19th, 2023. So that's a small typo. We don't want to do that last year. <laughs> Any comments? Uh, these are all the third Thursdays of, of the month, from no November 17th onwards. Any comments? Any questions? Uh, just one to, uh, sure. With those being count all? Uh, uh, yes, they will. They will be in town. Okay, so uh, we can move on to uh, the next item in our agenda, which is correspondence. We received an email to the Finance Committee from Donald Desio of 6 Sam Allen Circle regarding online payment convenience fees. It was dated October 2nd, 2022. There was no other correspondence uh, received during this period. 
So that completes the items on our um, uh, on our agenda. Do I have a motion to adjourn so, this meeting? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor of, of adjourning uh, this finance committee meeting, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. The motion so passes. Thank you for your participation. Thank you.